Today's guest is Dr. Keith Loy, who is a researcher in immunology in Melbourne. Keith completed a Bachelor of Biomedicine in Infection and Immunity at the University of Melbourne in 2014, an additional honours degree in immunology in 2015, where he researched neural regulation of T lymphocytes and then achieved his PhD from the University of Melbourne in immunology in 2020, looking into the role of the sympathetic nervous system in T cell responses. He has more recently worked as a postdoc researcher at the Peter Doherty Institute for Infection and Immunity and is now enlightening the next generation of immunology students and future researchers and clinicians as a senior tutor and lecturer at the University of Melbourne. Keat has also been heavily involved in outreach programs, including mentoring and hosting new students to campus life. Keat and I actually met in 2013 when volunteering together as part of an outreach program with underrepresented students who were about to prepare for their year 12 VCE. I've known Keith for a number of years. We, well, we met eight years ago and uh, it was really good to be able to, to sit down and catch up with Keith and hear about what his career has been like so far and the move into academia as well. So hopefully you enjoy the conversation. So Keith, it's great to be sitting down with you again um, and speaking after what is like almost a decade of it, that, that time has gone so, so fast. Yeah, no, but, um, thanks for having me, Jesse. Yeah, it's definitely been a long time, um, but it's cool that, you know, we're still in touch and we still see what we're up to and you've got something great going on. So I'm excited to delve into the discussion and hopefully it'll help someone figure some things out. Yeah, cool. All right. And so I got in touch with you because I think like this podcast the intention of it is to give greater depth to people watching. Um, obviously, a lot of my audience are actually in applications to an MD program, but there are also a lot of people that are interested in the research pathway, which is something that we'll, we'll look at as well. Uh, but obviously, because now you're also in education, tertiary education as well in the immunology field, I think that this particular episode gives people a real kind of breadth and depth of understanding of the different careers that are available in the health sciences and the medical sciences. And I would hope that the discussion today inspires people either to start planning a career in either a field that you've gone into or something parallel to it. And even if they're looking to pursue an MD, that the knowledge and the insights that you can provide will help them be better clinicians as well. Because in my mind, I might be a little bit naive in it, but it does feel like the divisions are a little bit kind of isolated in a way. And it would be nice to, to have a resource where all of that information is being shared across disciplines, across fields as well, so that no matter which path people go in, they've actually got a broader and more global understanding as well of what they're doing, and where they fit in. I've always thought about how things are integrated between the MD, especially, you know, as someone who did the Bachelor of Biomedicine, a lot of the cohort and a lot of my friends did end up making it into the MD program somewhere in Australia or overseas. Mm. Um, and comparing their journey compared uh, to mine, it, it's quite different, but there are also a lot of similarities in, te in terms of the things that we learn and what skills are usable between the two areas. So I think it's definitely worth considering, um, mm. even if you are set in medicine or if you are considering something in industry or considering some sort of research position, it's important to remember how everything interacts because at the end of the day, like we're all working towards this common goal, you know? Yeah, perfect. And that, I couldn't have said it better. Like that's exactly it. I think that sometimes the, the pathways get so funneled down to the day-to-day -day that it's, um, it's kind of not being able to see the forest for the trees, so to speak, in that what we're all really trying to do is play a role in improving healthcare really and improving health of people. And sometimes that happens in the lab and other times that happens at the patient's bedside or hopefully I'll be speaking to people in like public health policy and that kind of thing as well. It can, it can happen in an office setting. And so I think, yeah, tying all this together will be hopefully a really valuable resource. Cool. And so as well as that, I will end up coming back to your role now, actually teaching uh, undergraduate students, I believe it is. Yes, yes. Yep. So I wanted to just ask, because it did come as, well, it came as a surprise to me, but not, not in terms of like what I know about you. Like, I was like, this makes total sense. I was like, I knew this is, this is where it was going to go, that you were going to move into educating people. Because I think it's just been like at the heart of who you are as well in a lot of ways. So maybe you could detail for everyone how that actually came about. 
Yeah, so I think the transition is quite interesting. I mean, to be honest, when I first started my PhD, um, I've always sort of considered teaching to be one of the things that I might end up doing, more specifically lecturing and sort of being in tertiary education. Um, so when I started my PhD, the ultimate goal was to maybe end up lecturing and whether it was a full-time teaching um, position or a part-time half teaching, half learning kind of thing, mm. sorry, half teaching, half research kind of thing. Um, but I think after my PhD, you know, there was the whole uh, slight issue of the pandemic where things got a little messy and um, a lot of options got changed around and you know, it just so happened that I managed to find a full-time research position. So I sort of fell into that. And it's quite competitive to find a teaching position, especially at the University of Melbourne, that, where I'm working now. Um, so once I finished my PhD, I sort of worked into re uh, as a postdoc um, and did some research, pure research. You know, I was 100% research. And it was very exciting. There was a lot of cool things happening there was you know, some really interesting results coming up. But I think at the end of the day, I realized that I didn't want to be just stuck at the bench. Um, the kind of research that I was doing was very wet lab based. So I was always just you know, running experiments, things not working, you're trying to troubleshoot why, you go back, do it again, it doesn't work again. And you, know, you could do so many changes and it just doesn't quite work out. Right. So I think I was sort of trying to figure out, all right, if this isn't going to be what's for me, what other pathways can I go on to, you know? And yeah, it just so happened that it was a teaching position that came up and I was lucky enough to get it. So that was how I sort of moved in and it's all within my same department. So I was very lucky. Uh, I didn't have to look around too hard. Um, I have been quite involved in my department. So people know, knew who I was. So when I applied, you know, I got a lot of feedback, a lot of mentoring, um, yeah. a lot of help. So it, it didn't, it wasn't too hard for me to transition from my PhD into a postdoc into a teaching position, but that, yeah. I know that's definitely not the case for most people. Right. Okay. Yeah. And so the, the subject that you're teaching at the moment, we were speaking a little bit about it before you said that it's kind of like a foundational um, immunology subject. What year level is it at? Yeah. I'm actually uh, teaching third year immunology. So it's a subject called oh, okay. principles, principles of immunology. So it's uh, one of the subjects that uh, students doing immunology or infection and immunity will have to do to complete it as part of your major at the University of Melbourne. Um, right. And yeah, it's, it's actually one of the subjects that got me really interested in immunology to begin with, because mm -hmm. I'm, well, as, as you said, no, my major was infection and immunity, but it was more microbiology based than immunology when I did it. Mm -hmm. um, so I was, I'm technically a microbiologist, but, you know, through my honors and my PhD, I ended up in the immunology side of things. Yeah, very immunology focused. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Okay. I think the um, I think that subject, the principles of immunology, I think that's the only taste of immunology that I might have had. But I don't know if it was a third or a second year one in my undergrad. Um, yeah, I think I think it was a principal subject, and I think I enjoyed it. But uh, I know that I stayed away from it because I knew that it was really complicated. <laughs> <laughs> I remember that the little bit of Im like uh, immunity that you learn in like the foundational biology subjects in first year, I was like, oh, this is tricky. I'm going to stay away from that. Yeah, yeah, it's it's actually it is quite daunting. I know a lot of people who start off in immunology, even with, you know, first year med students who don't actually do any immunology, apart from the slight little bit that they might cover in, you know, depending on what course they do, they might cover a little bit, but your first proper introduction to immunology can be quite daunting because there's all these abbreviations being thrown about. You got to remember how things split off, how things differentiate. It, it yeah. is quite a lot. So, you know, yeah. it's not for everyone, but I think it's important to know a little bit just so you know how things work, especially in our current um, environment. It's important absolutely. to have a bit of knowledge. Yeah, yeah, from. absolutely. And so, and so I've broken this uh, down into a, a few different parts. And so the first part was looking at your research specifically across the, the honours year, the PhD, and then also postdoc research as well. Um, but I guess before we jump into that, we might look at just what it was that drew you to research. Mm -hmm. It's particularly interesting because obviously you said once you're actually working, it was the, the very lab focused environment that actually made you go, you know, what, I want was it more human kind of connection, yeah. Yeah. so to speak? Yeah. So 
I looked and like, obviously, if you were to look at your resume and the intro that I ran through there, it's it's obviously a very direct and very clear path towards research. So it sounds like it was something that you kind of had in your head pretty, pretty early on. Um, what was it that drew you to research the most? I think it was, so while my path is pretty, you know, it's been straight research all the way, I think my ultimate goal was really always, as I said, lecturing was, has always been a part of my, you know, oh, that'd be really fun kind of thing. Yeah. Um, so I think I remember there was this point in third year where I was thinking, well, if I want to be a lecturer, what do I have to do? I have to get a PhD. If I have to get a PhD, right. I do honors. And, you know, it was, it's sort of that thing. I don't know if you are familiar with it, but I used to remember people telling me in high school and then I passed this on as well. Like you always have this like goal focused, what do you want? And then you work backwards to get to that step kind of thing. Anyway, yeah. so that was what I did in third year. And I remember specifically that it happened in third year because in our in the Bachelor of Biomedicine, there's this core subject called Molecule Stimality. Mm -hmm. And basically in this subject, you look at five different maladies or six, five or six different ones. And it's, you know, you sort of look at it from a molecular aspect, like how it causes the disease, what the disease is and how we treat it. So it was a very clear stepwise procedure. And I remember for one of the uh, modules, it was the neurodegenerative module. So, you know, they came in and talk about, it had guest lecturers come in and talk about uh, neurodegenerative diseases. And, you know, this lecturer cannot remember who it was now. It's been what, eight, nine years now. Um, but yeah, this lecturer was talking about this neurodegenerative disease explaining to us. And then he got to a point where he was actually presenting data from his own lab that was supposed to turn the field around and sort of really change the way that people thought about this certain aspect in that field. And I remember sitting there in that lecture going, that is so cool, like to actually find something that changes what people know about um, knowledge, you know? Yeah. And I remember when I started honors and it really reinforced that thinking of how cool research was, was um, I was listening to someone speak and they were, you know, sort of putting this example where if you pretend human knowledge is a circle and what you're doing with research is you're standing at the edge of the circle and making just this tiny, tiny little bump. But as everyone adds to that little bump, that circle grows and, so, and you're just yeah. pushing those boundaries and really, you know, making what we know a lot more plentiful. And then further down, you'll help someone in the future. And I, I thought that was an amazing way to do it. Um, and like I said, it was sort of a way that I could get to lecturing and being recognized as someone who could be an expert in the field. Um, yeah. so yeah, that, that was all I pieced together. And then just yes, here I am now, 10 years later. Yeah. That's really cool. It's, it's interesting as well that you said like the, the first thing was, it was the ultimate end goal of moving into academia and, and education. And it was like, okay, research is the pathway. And then something was the push from the other end. Like actually, you know, this is something that you'll be really passionate about. And it's yeah. from both ends, you've like pushed and pulled into research. Yeah. 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 Cool. And so I guess this is something that I'd be really interested to know. And I'm sure a lot of people watching would be interested to know. For me, research feels like a very, and this might just be because I avoided any research pathway in my undergrad. <laughs> as, <laughs> as, most do, as most yeah, people do. As most people do. Yeah, it didn't interest me. I remember I did one research fo focus subject. I think it was neurochemistry or something. And it was, it was intense. That's all I can remember. Yeah. Um, and so I guess it, it does feel like a relatively closed part of, of health and, and uh, medical science to me, something that I'm not very aware of what actually goes on. So looking, we'll look at say your, the PhD, cause that's obviously probably the, the Holy grail or it's the largest part of that kind of process to, yeah. to going into postdoc research. Yeah. What would you say were the, the highlights and the lowlights of that time and that research? How much time do you have, Jesse? We could be here for a while. <laughs> no, um, I think what what you what you say what you said about you know not really knowing what research is like um, is very very prominent even up to now, and it's something I'm quite passionate about trying to um, get people to understand a bit more because I think I wish I could understand a little bit more about research when I was in undergrad because there's there's a lot of different types of research. I feel like when we talk about research. Um, and I'll, I'll go into my own experiences in a sec, but 
I just wanted to cover when we talk about research, a lot of the time the default is thinking about, oh, going into that lab space and running experiments, you know, chemicals, pipettes, safety glasses, that kind of stuff. Yeah. But there's actually a lot more to research in the sense that you also have a lot of more clinical and qualitative based research, you know, policies, um, questionnaires, looking at trends, um, bioinformatics. Now it's huge. You know, there's, there's a lot of what we call dry lab. Um, research that happens in and around the universities. Um, and I wish that was something that I was made a little bit more aware of in my undergrad, um, because I think through all throughout my undergrad, my idea of research has always been like the wet lab. You are stuck in the lab doing things kind of, right. kind of research. Um, so yeah, I think all throughout my honors and definitely my PhD, uh, there are way too many highlights and lowlights, especially in the PhD. If you were to ask any PhD student, if any one of them says that they were happy the entire way, they are 100% lying. There is no chance, <laughs> um, especially in the second year. The second year is what we call like the PhD blues. It's just second year blues. Um, it's rough. Things aren't working. You feel like you're making no headway in your project. Uh, so there, there are a lot of the times where, like I said earlier, you know, you're sort of going into experiments, doing them getting the results and then when you analyze them or even when you're getting the results, you realize that something has gone wrong and mm -hmm. you have no idea why and you've just wasted an entire day. Um, so that was always very frustrating. Um, and just make, it's because it's such a long process, right? When you do a PhD, you know, it took me four years. Uh, yep. They say it takes three years, but most people, you know, take three to four years at the minimum. Yep. Um, because it's such a long process, you don't really see how everything comes together until the very end. So at the start, it can get quite demotivating when you feel like you're not going anywhere. And that's not everyone's experience. Some people are really, you know, they have fantastic PhDs. They're publishing amazingly. Um, they're, they're getting great results. Everything seems to make sense. And when you hear stories like that, and then you think of your own research being like, ah, oh, why didn't anything work? And that was my experience. My entire honors year, like not, I, I couldn't really get any positive data. Still did really well. Um, and that's something that people have to be aware of in research. Just because you, your experiment doesn't work doesn't mean that you're making bad research. It just means right. that you're taking a longer step to get there. Yep. Anyway, I digress. Um, yeah, so when you get to that point where you're looking at someone else and they're doing amazingly, you know, they're publishing, they're getting great results and you yourself are not, it makes you feel very imposter syndrome-y and like, oh, what am I doing here? Nothing's going right. And though, no, most of the lowlights from my PhD um, was definitely to do with that and just being frustrated that, you know, things aren't working. You're wasting all this. No, okay. I'm going to say wasting. You're using all this time to... And it's not leading to the result. Yeah, yeah. And you know, I mean, unfortunately, that is the scientific process. You know, you do something, it doesn't work. You try and figure out why, change something, go back and do it again. So, okay. you know, a lot of the lowlights... For, for me at least, reflected and revolved around that lack of progress. Um, and I think I'm someone who just need that bit of validation to say that, oh, things are actually working and, um, you know, I've got something going on, right? Right. So that was, that was rough. But, you know, the highlights have definitely been quite a lot as well because research isn't just about being in the lab. I don't think I got as many opportunities as I would have liked. Um, and it's definitely true for people in the more recent years to go mm -hmm. to conferences. Um, I was lucky enough to go to at least one conference a year, uh, but they were just national conferences within Australia or within Victoria even. Um, but some people get to go international and present. And um, you know, it's, it's nice to be able to present to an international audience because then you get a bit more feedback. Uh, about your research, you talk to people, you could end up collaborating. And it's also just nice getting a little bit of a holiday, you know, going somewhere else. And yeah, it, it's a nice it's all, it's all paid for too, isn't it? Those yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. some sometimes you have to find funding for it, but um, right. yeah. most times it's pretty good. Yeah. Um, so, you know, a lot of my highlights have to do with meeting other researchers and then, mm. you know, you sort of, talk about the science. I love talking about science. Uh, we had a day where our lab and another lab went away and we discussed just, you know, where our research was taking us, the big picture kind of stuff, why mm -hmm. it was important. And there were some really, really good discussions from that. 
So I really enjoyed actually talking the science and discussing why things are the way they are. Um, so that that was always really fun. And you do do a lot of cool techniques. You know, you're, I'm playing with very expensive equipment, like my PhD, and I'm sure we'll cover this a little bit later, but um, my work did a, uh, used a lot of microscopy. So I used some really fancy, expensive microscopes um, that did some really, really cool imaging. And, you know, once you get the end result of it, you're like, okay, this is, this is very cool. Like to imagine looking at a cell move, you know, that's, that kind of experience is really nice. It's very niche. Mm -hmm. uh, I can't really see that being used in a, you know, real world practical example. Like you're not going to use a microscope every, every now and then, but yeah just at that time when you're working through those techniques, it's, it's a real privilege to sort of see the type of work and understanding um, mm. that comes from it. Yeah. Yeah. Cause I guess that's like, that is really as close as you can get to seeing the theory of science that you've dedicated to understanding really being put into action and being applied as well. Right. Just have, yeah. having direct connection must be yeah. a satisfying thing. And it's actually a huge benefit. And again, I keep bringing it back to, you know, the situation that we are now, because a mm. lot of issues that have come up recently is just from a lack of scientific literacy. And um, just, you don't need to know the nitty gritty of science. You just need to know how to interpret like what is good data and what is not. And, right. you know, doing a PhD really helped me, like, because I was obviously required to read a lot of papers. Um, it's so much easier to, digest information and you sort of think more critically about the information that you get. Mm. Um, I actually, I was discussing this with someone yesterday and it's been a lot easier for me to teach people as well after the PhD, because um, right. when I was in my undergrad, and this might be useful for people who are um, going through their third year or whatever right now, sometimes when you get to third year, you're starting to get into the specifics of things, right? So you go and do a little Google search and you start to find a paper and you start reading it. And it's really difficult to understand what you're trying to get out of it. But I found for myself, if a student asked me a question and I didn't know it and I had to go look it up, actually skimming through the research paper has been so much easier now compared to back then because I just learned the skills and the way to actually read what the data says and um, understand what the authors were trying to say. So yeah. I think that was that was a really cool, and it's not so much a highlight during a PhD, but it's more like a reflection back now. That yeah. skill that I picked up has been very useful. Mm. That's an interesting one. Yeah. So it's almost like there's a, it's interesting as well, because did you ever during the, the PhD, was there ever any explicit, I guess, like instruction on how to critically analyze peer-reviewed journals or is it just something that happens through practice because you, your life is dedicated to reading and analyzing papers? Yeah, uh, it yeah. depends. Some labs do something called a journal club. So uh, some labs, you know, you have to read a journal, uh, journal article maybe once a week or once a fortnight. And then we get together mm -hmm. and we discuss what the paper has said, um, what are the important points, things like that. Uh, right now, some of the subjects that my department is involved in, we're starting to introduce that journal club to undergrads because we found that it's really important for undergrad students to be able to get that skill so that they can skim read papers and actually get the information out of it rather than being bogged down by all the minutia and you know the jargon of the paper if you actually break it down you can get a lot more out of it so yeah. I probably learned a little bit from my undergrad because when I did it in my third year that was the first time they started introducing journal club and then throughout my PhD our labs in um, initiated a lot of journal clubs as well so you kind of just get initiated into it you see how other people read and present data and you sort of make that connection for yourself um, mm -hmm. it is something that's quite difficult to explain and teach but I think it is yeah if you get some practice out of it it does help a lot obviously yeah yeah cool and so moving on to looking at the the honors year and the PhD project and then further we'll also look at the some of the postdoc research you were doing last year as well yeah um could you maybe detail a little bit for the audience about what the research aims were for the the honors project and then the the phd project as well and then what you kind of found from that yeah so like my actual research right like yeah was, yeah so yeah. in my honors year um when i was selecting my honors project it was kind of 
I think by that time I knew I wanted to go back into immunology because after doing principles of immunology, I found that that was more my area compared to microbiology. So I think I might have interviewed for one or two sort of virology labs, but at the end of the day, I think I, I went with immunology. And the project that I ended up signing up for was to do with the uh, neural regulation of immune, immune cells. So specifically, we're looking at T cells, which is a type of the white blood cell that we use that are pretty commonly uh, utilized for cancer treatments and antiviral treatments, sort of. They're, they're the main key responders for, for those kind of responses. Um, so when I went to look at the honors projects, you know, I saw my supervisor present this movie, right? So it's, a it's sort of like a time-lapse thing where it takes a picture every 30 seconds or so. And you see it was within a lymph node of a mouse. And you see this these cells that were fluorescently tagged and you see them move around in real time. And you know, when you stimulated the uh, sympathetic nervous system, those cells stop moving. And then after a bit of time, they start moving again. So that was super cool and interesting to think about. I was like, oh, okay. So, you know, if you stimulate the sympathetic nervous system, it seems like your cells just stop doing things. And then eventually they start doing again. And, you know, the sort of questions that came up were like, is that a good thing? Is that a bad thing? Um, you know, if we go into the real minutia of things like cells do have to stop so that they can encounter other cells and recognize what needs to be done. But you also need cells to be moving to like sites of infection in order to carry out their responses. So, you know, that question of like, is this stopping a good thing or a bad thing? Why? How would it end up affecting the overall response? That was really cool. So, um, you know, I ended up taking that project and it was actually a huge project. Um, it wasn't quite so much necessarily structured as an honors project. So if people are looking for honors projects, there are some projects that are typically structured in the sense that it can definitely be done within the six months that you do honors. Because yep. when you're doing honors, you do a mix of coursework and research. So even though it's a year of honors, technically you're really only doing the lab portion of it for about six months. Six so months, yeah. Yeah, some, some projects are designed specifically to wrap up within that one year. It's just you know, a little component of a bigger project that no one else in the lab has time to do. So they try to train an honor student to do it. Um, and it's something that can be completed. Whereas yeah. the project that I signed up for, because it was such a big picture, like we see an effect, but we don't understand why, we don't understand how, um, there was a lot of scope for it to grow into a PhD project. And that was something that I was interested in. That was something that my supervisor really wanted someone to work on as well. Um, yeah. So yeah, we, we ended up doing that. And halfway through my honors, someone else, a postdoc came in and worked on this project as well, but from a different facet. Um, so yeah, we, I didn't, like I said earlier, um, I didn't really get any conclusive evidence as to why it was why? the case. Um, mm. And if like treating actually had a clear response. So one yeah. of, I think, yeah, one of the things that came out was that some of the response was a little bit uh, down downturned when you activated the sympathetic nervous system, but we couldn't figure out why. And it wasn't always a consistent result. Like there was an end result that was set, uh, relatively consistent in terms of like viral titers because we were using viruses as a model. Um, so, you know, it, it seemed like it was poor viral control, but we could, could never figure out why or how. So my honors year ended up stopping there. And then yeah. in my PhD, we continued to pick up from there and tried a few different aspects. Um, still not really, uh, getting got, didn't really get anywhere in the end. Um, we ended up looking at the same virus using the same virus and looking more about the innovation of the spleen, um, mm -hmm. because that was one of the organs that we worked with a lot and we did see some sort of effect there and we're still tidying up some loose ends and trying to find a mechanism to explain explain what happens to the nerves in the spleen during viral infection uh but yeah it's it's kind of been a wall for the lab and because i've left the lab for a few years now they're still working on it just not in full capacity um yep. so hopefully something comes out of it but half maybe not halfway a year into my phd um because things weren't really progressing that well we we're still trying to figure out all of these different things and we couldn't quite get what we wanted we started to look at other aspects of neural regulation. So um, my PhD lo looked at neural regulation. So not just a sympathetic nervous system, but 
how nerves interplay with um, an immune response, right? So one yeah, because of- that was going to be sorry to cut you off. That was going to be something that I was going to ask: is the the interaction between the nervous system and the immune system was that something relatively new at that time, um, or that specific interaction that was new and un- I- unexpected? So, I mean, it's always neuro, neuro regulation has always been a hot topic ever since yeah. the 80s. Uh, there's, there's been a lot of research that shows that there is a lot of communication between the nervous system and the immune response, but it's never quite clear how, you know, sometimes it feels like if you stimulate, again, going back to just the sympathetic nervous system portion of it, if you mm. stimulated the sympathetic nervous system, some immune responses were better, some were worse. But if you block the, those um, activation signals, your immune response could also be better, but sometimes it could also be worse. So it's this really fine nice. balance. And I think that's why immunology can be so confusing because it's never quite a clear cut answer. Um, you think of immunology, it's always a bit of a tipping scale. You know, it, it always tries to keep things in balance. And once you go too far on one end, um, things get out of balance. And yep. you see the effects of it, whether it's autoimmunity or it's you know lack of control of virus or cancer. Um, so yeah, I think it's it's that aspect of balancing things that make it really hard. And mm-hmm. it's already hard enough for an immune response. Like just a, if you look at a basic re- immune response, that balance is already really hard to keep track of because there's so much regulation within the immune response itself that when you throw in something like neuroimmunology where you're looking at activation of nerves and the little you know, chemokines or cytokines or molecules that are secreted by nerves um, and cells associated with the nervous system, that mm. it just adds a whole nother layer to it all. So um, balance. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's even harder to distinguish at what point things are being checked and at what point things are being interrupted. Um, mm. So one of the aspects of the project that I was on was a lot of the work between the sympathetic nervous system and the immune response, a lot of it was done in the 80s and 90s. So they were quite out, not outdated, but obviously the techniques that we have to study the immune system have grown significantly since then. And there was a little bit of work in the, you know, 2010s that started to pick up on this again, but it Mm. wasn't very widely worked on. So that's why, you know, we thought that it would be really cool to sort of look at it. But I think, yeah, yeah, one of the reasons why it hasn't been worked on is because it's so hard to actually figure out what to do from there. Um, So, yeah, because of that, we ended up sort of building a separate project um, and we're looking at immune responses in the cornea because the cornea is a highly innovated um, surface. Mm -hmm. It's um, an immune, immune privilege site which means that immune responses in the cornea are very tightly regulated because uh, you don't want any immune response going on in your cornea that would damage it too much because that's going to block your sight and therefore, you know, make it really difficult for you to live. You know, if you think back to when you have to go hunting and whatnot, um, you need your sight, like that's important. Yeah, so so we were trying to figure out what would actually happen in the cornea if, an immune response was required. So there has been a lot of study in terms of like one of the really well-known models is herpes in the eye. So it's one of the leading cause of viral blindness, especially in um, underdeveloped countries where, you know, you get hepatitis in the eye and it goes a bit crazy. And we know that that response is due to your T cells or a certain subset of your T cells that overreact and sort of cause a lot of inflammation in the cornea and start to blur it and you start to lose your vision. So what we ended up doing was looking at something called resident memory T cells. So our department is very well known for the studies of resident memory T cells. Mm -hmm. And what they are is, you know, sorry to go into a bit of detail, but uh, (laughs) what they are is they're cells that sort of stay lodged in your tissues. So Mm -hmm. typically T cells recirculate around your body, they look for um, things that need to be removed um, so that it can initiate a response. But these resident memory T cells stay lodged in your body after there has been some sort of insult or injury or infection. Um, memory T cells can stay in that site and then generate a really rapid response. 
So one of the things that came up probably in the last 10, 15 years is resident memory T cells, um, where we always thought memory T cells were also circulating, but then there's this specific subset that do get lodged in tissues so that if anything happens in that site, there's a very rapid response again. So almost we like, thinking, a, like a mast cell in an allergic response kind of thing kind, like that. Kind of. It won't be as rapid as a mast cell. Um, mast yeah. cell responses are insane, but yeah. In, in a similar concept where it can like act and secrete cytokines and molecules to help control that infection really, really quickly. And like there's actually head. be some really good research on potentially using resident memory cells to control cancer. Um, there was mm -hmm. a public a paper published a couple of years ago now in Nature Immunology um, yep. from our department looking at using TRM cells and controlling melanoma. What TRM cells? Uh, resident memory T cells, sorry. Oh, yeah. right, yeah. TRM, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's just, a, it's just easier than saying resident memory T cell every single time. Yep. So TRM. Um, yeah, yep. so we, we got interested because, like I said, our department's really big on it. And my supervisor contributed to one of the uh, studies that was quite um, important in identifying resident memory T cells. And we were working with the lab that was um, responsible for doing it. So right. we were thinking, what would happen to the cornea if you had, say, herpes infection? whether those memory T cells, would they be good? Would they be bad? Do they even exist in the cornea because it's such an immune privileged site? Uh, if you have no infection, so if you're just healthy, your regular cornea, you typically don't get very many immune cells in there. Um, but you know, when we sort of use the model of herpes infection, and uh, obviously it's an animal model, it's not infecting humans with herpes in the eye. Uh, yeah. um, when we did that, we saw that these T cells actually swarm into the eye at quite high numbers. And again, this is well known, but then um, no one has really looked if those T cells stay there and what, what they do. So we yeah. actually ended up trying to see if resident memory T cells do exist in the cornea. Can they exist? And if they do, like what's important for them to exist? Um, so we actually just got a paper published about it uh, two weeks ago now. So oh, it, okay. it just got accepted. I'm sorry. It got accepted. It'll get published once it's gone through the whole editorial process, but it's accepted. So, you know, we found that uh, TRM cells can exist in the cornea and they can provide some sort of protection for secondary infections. Um, but as to how exactly it does that and how efficient it is, we still need to do more research because it's incredibly difficult to study these cells. As I said, the cornea is very highly regulated. And if you think about a mouse cornea, it's mm -hmm. way smaller than a human cornea. So when you want to try to study these really rare cells, yeah. it's very difficult to do so. Um, but yeah, so that was that was the second half of my PhD was working on these cells in the cornea. Um, I was spending a lot of time sort of flipping back and forth between the nerves and the spleen and viral infection to nerves in the cornea and TRM cells and viral infection there. So, you know, a lot of my PhD was spent like if, Things weren't really working on one project. I would set it aside for a bit, jump to the other project, work on that, yeah. got bored of it, go back to the other one. So it was a lot of back and forth. And um, yeah, we were, I was quite lucky to have you know other members in the lab help me finish off this cornea paper because as I said, I've left a few years now. Um, yeah. But yeah, that was that was the yeah. outcome. That's really cool. That's it's yeah, really really cool because um, like neuroscience, that was my that was my focus in my undergrad, um, and I loved it. And so as soon as I saw like I was following all your research while you were doing it and everything yeah. in, the, in the background, in the shadows watching. <laughs> really cool. Um, and yeah, just it blew my mind even just to see, I, I don't know, you just, of course, all the different systems interact and everything, but immune system and nervous system seem like two of the most isolated and heavily regulated systems that we have. And the idea that they're intermingling, as you said, the complexity of that and trying to I mean, the, the difficulty in just trying to cre create controls, right? Like under, like to control so many different factors, I guess you would have to go with a model where you can, you can know that whatever is fluctuating is, is fluctuating on an average or like... Yeah, you would assume that everything is sort of fluctuating across the board. So, you know, because you're only changing one component, those fluctuations don't yeah. matter so much because it's yeah. happening throughout everything. But you know, it's it's not the, it's not an ideal world, and that's why I think getting good, clear, clean data for biology 
um, whether it be immunology, cell biology, metabolism, whatever it is, it's really difficult to get good clean data because you know when you're studying a biological system, it's never in isolation. You know, there's always so much happening. Whether you're studying the ecology or you know behavior of birds or whatever, to mm. right down to yeah neuroimmunology. There's so much interplay between everything that it's hard to actually single out the one thing and say, it's definitely this thing. Sometimes you right. can do that with you know genetic manip manipulation. You knock out genes so that gene is completely uh, gone. Mm -hmm. um, so then you can actually say it is that gene. But even then, you could always think about one or two different systems in your body that could potentially compensate for that and therefore yep. you know, produce a different result. Yeah, you can never create a perfectly isolated no. system in yeah. any way. And yeah. even if you do, it's then not clearly representative of what's happening in the real world. Like you can, we exactly. in research, yeah. we, can, we do a lot of isolating work in terms of like cell culture. So you can like put cells in a dish, incubate it, and then really control what goes on in the environment of that cell. But then that's not exactly, the organism, yeah. yeah, yeah. It's not exactly yeah. reflective of all the different things that the cell might see in a mm. natural setting. Yep, fair enough. And so you mentioned before about the microscopy techniques and things maybe not being as applicable and that kind of thing. Yeah. But some of the, the research that you were talking about there, um, looking at the interplay between those two systems, do you know if there's any, I guess, what kind of uh, clinical applications might stem from this kind of research? Like, obviously it seems to still be somewhat in its infancy, mm. but as it goes, like what, yeah, what kind of, uh, what kind of applications of this knowledge could be applied in a clinical setting? Yeah, I think so. That is one of the things that's really hard to sort of get your head around, especially what we call, we're doing a lot of basic research. So when we talk about basic, we're talking about like fundamental sort of foundational level, like really understanding how molecules interact. So yep. for example, taking that cornea paper that I was discussing and you know, understanding how these cells might form, like in what capacity can the cells form? Like, do they form mm. after any regular old infection? Do they need specific signals? Um, and that's what we do a lot with, for example, that cancer paper as well. Like they, they look at a lot of what actually generates these um, cells to be there. And mm. when we actually understand what is critical in this process, uh, we can actually then target, you know, therapies for it. So for example, um, one of the major molecules that contribute to developing TRM cells is something called TGF beta, all right? It's, it's a factor that um, is secreted by a variety of cells Usually it's quite immunosuppressive, so it controls the magnitude of your immune response, um, which is really important because you don't want things to go too crazy, but it has a lot of other effects as well. So it's never one thing that, like I said, many interweaving pathways, I won't go into too much detail, but so for example, if we consider TGF beta, um, mm -hmm. if it's an important thing, then, well, we know that we need to target it, whether we block it completely or we supplement the system with more TGF beta and then that might you know probe a response to go and favor that in that direction and then yep. produce a better outcome you know so it's really from doing this kind of research and understanding at the core of it how each molecule is important in the entire process so that we can then manipulate it and it's, it's very similar to vaccine development or antiviral development you know you try and understand what is important to the pathogen? What is important to the bacteria, important to viruses? You know, the, the vaccines that we have now for COVID, um, people have studied that this virus needs this very specific protein to enter cells. Or so, you know, we got to create something that will target that protein um, and stop it from working or, you know, uh, recognizing it and neutralizing it through antibodies or whatever immune response that you can generate. Um, mm. So, yeah, it's really through understanding this basic research that we can then manipulate and bring it to a more practical setting. Right. Yeah. And I guess that makes sense that you've got to kind of build the, the hierarchy of understanding from the ground up. And so there's going to be lots of layers and lots of projects and probably lots of years of research that, yeah. that work towards that. Yeah. Very, very uh, complicated and very long process as well. Yeah. So yeah. I think it's, that's why, you know, a lot of people, when you think of research, they think of all these really minutia, um, like you have to go into so much detail in this one little molecule and it's quite difficult to then see how that 
can relate to the real world, you know, because mm. when you see a patient, you're not looking at this one molecule, you're seeing that they've got some sort of condition that they need to overcome. So what drugs can we use to do that? But in order to understand how those drugs work, you have to do this basic research to yep. actually figure out, oh, this is going to be effective and it's not going to interrupt some other pathway that's important, you know? Yeah, absolutely. I'm just thinking now I'm definitely going to, I'm going to link this podcast episode to all of my year 12 bio students <laughs> as well, because I know they do rational drug design and everything. And they always ask me, why do I learn about this stuff? And yeah. I'm going to, I'm going to make them watch this. <laughs> it's it's important. I'm sure they'll be very excited to actually learn yeah. about it, but yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, cool. So uh, on top of that as well. So then after your PhD, you were then working as a postdoc researcher at the Doherty Institute as well. Yeah. And so was your research there still focused on this kind of field or did it start to branch out? So my postdoc, um, it's still focused a lot on T cell work. So uh, in my PhD, I was still at, I was at Doherty for um, my PhD as well. But oh, right. yeah, 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 it was. Um, I focused a lot on T cells. So a lot of my work was T cell based. But then for my postdoc, I ended up moving to a slightly different field, and it was more to do with like vaccine design and um, sort of. There was a project on how we can utilize a different form of vaccination to mm -hmm. induce immune responses. So I was recruited to look at the immune response side of this, this project. So, you know, they've, they've got these um, vaccine uh, delivering technology and they want to see if it will actually generate a good immune response. Um, so I was recruited to work on that. And I was also working a little bit on B cells. It was quite a change so b cells are the cells that produce all our antibodies <laughs> yeah so i have to go and yeah. learn the other half and i'm still not an expert at it because i was only there for like a year and a half um and b cells are a lot more complicated in my in my view maybe it's because mm -hmm. i don't work i haven't worked with them for as long but um right. they they are a little bit more difficult to understand because the the nuances in this development and its effector function um it's mm -hmm. not quite as clear-cut again maybe just because i haven't been in the environment of a b cell lab I could be completely wrong. Uh, right. But for me, like T cell work was a lot more straightforward compared to the B cell work. Anyway, um, yeah, so in my, in my postdoc, I, I did a little bit of work on that, but it was very difficult again to do, get proper results. Um, maybe it's me, but uh, yeah, I, I was trying to see what the responses were like and I just could not really generate it. And I mean, I had an idea why it, that, why it didn't work. But, you know, we were discussing this and we say that could be a reason, but maybe it's just really difficult to figure out if there is an immune response. So um, the vaccine strategy that we were using um, generated a really good B cell response, but we couldn't quite see what's happening with the T cells. So we're trying to figure it out. Um, and I think they've moved on in a different direction now. I don't really know the details behind that because it was quite, of a, quite a up there kind of program. Um, I see. So yeah, they so were able to really work on like you were. They were asking you like, we need you to look at the effectiveness of the immune response, but that's all on yeah, this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So like a lot of the design. I mean, obviously, I was involved in some of the discussion, but you know, it, it's yeah. it's gone off in a different direction now, and I think it's right. it's getting some positive um, work coming out of it. So we'll see in the next couple of years, you know, if, if something comes up. But yeah, so that I ended up doing. A little bit something a little bit different still looking at immune response but um i didn't work with mouse models as much um and i didn't set up as many experiments because a lot of my work was collaborative in my postdoc it relied on right. um other people which is something that we can talk about if we're talking about research you know in terms of like collaborative research and yeah. your own research it, it's quite different for me at least definitely um was a very different experience. Um, did you want me to in, jump yeah, into in, that in now? Because yeah. I didn't actually really think about that, um, yeah. about collaborative versus independent research. Yeah. I just always assumed every time I've looked at a research paper, there's always multiple authors. So, yeah. yeah. So a lot of um, what research is gearing towards now is they really want to push collaborative research, especially between disciplines, because, you know, for example, something like neuroimmunology, again, you want to get experts in the neuro side and the immuno side and then come together and they can sort of figure out what is important on each side and then you know find right. a happy medium for it, we can understand it better so yep. um that's that's the collaborative in terms of like conceptually but then there's also a lot of collaborative in terms of like some labs just have better equipment and techniques 
in within their lab to run certain experiments compared to someone else. So for example, like my old lab, because we were a lot, we were mainly an imaging lab. So we had the expertise and the people who knew how to work microscopy. So we did a right. lot of microscopy, whereas another lab might have done a lot of um, PCRs, you know. So right. some labs have the capacity to do some things better. So you might have to work collaboratively in that sense. Um, whereas for me, during my PhD, I was very much, uh, here is my project. I was in charge of every aspect of it. So, you know, I had to set up my models. I had to uh, make sure everything was in place and I planned experiments. All right, I'm setting up on this day and then I will harvest on this day. And then, you know, I, I set my own schedule basically. Uh, right. For my postdoc, a lot of the work was collaborative in the sense that another lab was setting up a lot of the reagents or a lot of the models. Um, so I was always waiting for them to do something and then they would do it. And then I would have to jump in when, they, when they're ready. And then- So you're on their timeline. Yeah, kind of yeah. And so it's not, it's not as flexible in terms yeah. of what I was doing and how often I scheduled experiments because mm -hmm. I, I didn't have the capacity to set things up. So- you know, you kind of, in some ways it's nice because like, oh, well, I can't do any work, but um, <laughs> it's, it's difficult when you're in research because you get, like, you just want to set stuff up and like make things happen. And um, yep. it can, I was very, very uh, privileged in my PhD lab. We were quite a well-funded lab. So setting up experiments, I didn't really have to think too much about reagents um, and mm -hmm. costs. Whereas yep. some of the smaller labs, they're a bit more like careful with their planning because it's really hard to get a reagent or they're, they're sort of trying to manage their funding, um, right. which is a whole, you know, another rabbit hole in research. Um, but yeah, so I was so used to setting up my own stuff that I felt mm. very unproductive um, when I was in my postdoc. And, yep. you know, obviously everyone does things to really good standards and you, you would trust your collaborators to do things really well, but because mm. it's, one experiment has been passed down to many through many people that there's chances that people do things differently to you and then you know there mm -hmm. might be a little bit of a miscommunication or like there was a mislabeling and if something goes wrong in the experiment it's kind of like did it go wrong on my end or your end or is it just the experiment itself so it just introduces a lot more extra factors that can complicate mm -hmm. things um, obviously sometimes it can't be helped because if they have the technique and expertise for it, then they definitely have to do it. Right. Um, but it puts a lot more pressure on there being really effective communication yeah. between the teams and between the steps, right? Because yeah. a lot of, a lot of the projects would be very time dependent too, I'd imagine yeah. where it's like something can't be delayed or anything like that. So when you're working on someone else's schedule and being handed the next step could be exactly has the potential to be chaotic. So I will say. As an example, um, we, cause when we were working, so they were doing big studies at once, right? Whereas in the, when I was, if I set up my own stuff, I would obviously manage it myself and I can set, you know, what I'm setting up, what many, how many days, how much I want to work in one day, things like that. And sometimes yeah. I might be faster in harvesting compared to someone else, you know, so little factors mm -hmm. like that. But like, you know, in my, in my PhD, not PhD, in my postdoc, um, because they were setting up big experiments and they were harvesting a lot of different things, whereas I only want this one component, but they were getting stuff from all over the place. So it took them a lot longer. So by the time they could pass their reagents to me, it was like 2 p.m. And my experiment takes like eight hours at the very minimum. Oh, gosh. Um, so like you know, it takes eight hours to actually do the thing and then it'll take another four hours to run it on the machine. Um, yep. So I would, yeah, sometimes start at like 2 p.m. and then I would have no choice because I can't leave the cells in the fridge till the next day because then that will introduce yet another layer of variability. So you want to get things done as fresh as you can, right? Yep. So yeah, yeah, I would work, you know, till like 3, 4 a.m. just to make sure everything gets done. Um, it was also quite different because in my PhD lab, it was very like independent. So you were in charge of your own experiment and you would set things up in a way where you can manage. Whereas in my postdoc lab, it was a lot more collaborative in the sense that if you need help, you should ask for help to process right. samples and whatnot, which is a really good practice. But again, mm -hmm. it's just that introducing that extra layer of variability because everyone does things slightly differently. Even though we have protocols and yeah. stuff, you can't do it to the exact same extent. Um, yep. so you know, there's that pros and cons to working collaboratively, 
And it was something that I had to learn through my postdoc. Like, oh, you know, the, people do things differently and you, know, you have to like adapt in very different ways. Right. And is that a difference between the PhD and postdoc? Is it more likely that you would do independent research in PhD or is that just the case for you and other people might do more collaborative um, work? It was, it was just the case for me. Uh, my, my PhD was probably a little bit more independent than most. I didn't really have a direct supervisor within the lab. So my supervisor was the lab head who was completely off the bench now. He's just doing like, you know, big picture stuff um, yep. and managing the lab. Whereas some people might have a direct supervisor who is still working in the lab and of course the lab head as well to give like conceptual and intellectual feedback yeah. um so for me i had to learn a lot of the techniques myself like none of mm -hmm. no one in our lab uh actually knew what to do with the cornea because it, we like no one worked on it i was the very first one in the lab to do it and i had to like you know uh, we ended up getting another phd student who came from a cornea lab but she wasn't an immunologist so like she had to learn a little bit of the immunology and then pair it with her cornea knowledge to do yep. work. Um, so yeah, I, I set up a lot of stuff myself with some help from you know random people who had expertise in the specific areas. Um, so I, I think I would say that my PhD experience was a little bit more independent than most, and probably mm -hmm. why it was harder for me to adjust to like to that you know, collaborative getting help and you know, because I think for me, it was also like, oh, I'll just manage it myself. I don't want to trouble people. And like, because other people have their work as right. well. So you don't want to like interrupt their work and their project to help you do yep. yours because like, you know, it's your work. Yeah, especially because you, you would have, you said it was four years of the PhD. So you were probably also just like really settled in and really adjusted to the idea of just having the responsibility yeah. on your own shelf. Exactly. So it would feel like you're burdening someone if you're asking for help when really that's, it's that's probably the right thing what they're and encouraging you. That's that's a lot of stuff that I could go into as well in terms of you know like the the mentality and sort of preconceptions and research and we we can talk about this a little bit um, yeah. later on as well but yeah that, that that's a whole another aspect of doing a PhD or even any sort of research um, where it be, be honors or if you're working in academia like there's there's a lot of preconceived notions of what things are like which is changing you know as more and more people talk about it but there's still yeah that stigma in there. Right. Yeah. And so I guess now, like looking at the, the move, it, it's still, it's quite a jump, but into to now teaching, obviously it's such a different, I'd imagine it's a very different lifestyle hmm. um, going from full, are you still doing some research in labs like part-time or have you made the complete shift over to, to teaching now? Yeah, I'm, I'm full teaching now. Um, yeah. Like there's a couple of hours maybe here and there where I just like, help fit like we were finishing up the paper the cornea paper earlier this year so you know i jumped in and just sort of fill up gaps where it was needed and it's it's i have i'm pretty much just pure teaching now yeah yeah cool and so like it's it's funny because we were saying before like that it didn't surprise me because of what i knew about you that when you said it, i was like yep 100 percent makes total sense like i can see that like i can picture you in the classroom i don't know like it just it just makes total yeah. sense to me and what's also funny is like over these whole 10 years uh i literally could not i'd lose count of how many times i have seen either like a uni mob social media post or an article or something where i've just gone hey let's keep again <laughs> or like in a video or something like that so i would i would say that for the last 10 years you have been the unofficial ambassador for the university <laughs> um so how is it now like being officially employed by the university and like it, you are really like representing them as well on the educational side of things yeah. how, how is that going from being a student there for such a long time too to now being on the other side of it yeah um i don't think maybe because i've been in there for so long and that transition has been you know sort of gradual I don't think it's been yeah. such a such a big change. It's not like I was doing all these things, went away, and then came back. Yeah. Um, you know, I've been here the whole time, and yeah, mm. I, I did do a lot of sort of outreach, ambassador -y type things throughout my undergrad, my PhD, and people, some people recognize me from different things. So I teach at the university gym as well. Um, I teach body pump, so it's like a one hour fitness class. And I, at the start of the year, I was helping out with some of the first year MD students. They had a prac, like a wet lab session for microbiology. 
and I was helping out in that session. And yeah, one of one of the students came up after the class was like, "Hey, you teach body pump, right? I was in your class yesterday." And I was just like, "Oh, hey, yeah, you know, it's it's sort of that that kind of recognition." Um, my friends used to make fun of me all the time back in undergrad and PhD because they would be like, oh, we can't ever hang out with you on campus because every single time we walk with you, like you will bump into someone that you know. You know and yeah. it was just like, I mean, yeah, well, I was around a lot for um, at, at the university. I was, I was quite active. So yeah. the change is quite nice. It's, still quite, it's quite gradual. Um, hmm. It's pretty surreal to be teaching third-year students because like I'm not that much older. I mean, I'm like eight or nine years older than them, but um, it's... It's still pretty surreal to think that I'm, you know, sort of teaching the next generation of people who might be involved to go on and do mm-hmm. medicine or um, be a, you know, big time researcher or doing some important work somewhere. Uh, mm-hmm. It's it's a nice feeling. Um, yeah, I, I don't really yeah. know what else to say. It's just it's nice. I've been at the university for so long, and I'm very fortunate to still be able to work there and not have to change my environment too much. <laughs> Yeah, that's really cool. And so as well as that, like at the moment you're teaching the principles of immunology, do you have, uh, I guess, plans to then start to also be teaching other elements of, phys- uh, of immunology or branching into other elements of teaching as well down the track? Yeah, so I will probably be involved in some of the technique subjects. So there's a we have a techniques in immunology, which is more like a prac-based class, which I was demonstrating um, for when I was in my PhD. So I was you know, assisting in the practical labs, but now that I'm on the teaching staff, um, I will be you know, still involved in that subject, but in a different capacity. And I'm hoping that you know, eventually I'll sort of be involved in some of the biomed subjects as well. Uh, the core subjects, they've, they've done a big change in the first year biomed subjects. Um, hopefully I'll be involved in some of that. So there is capacity to be involved in other aspects, but it'll, be, it'll always be centered around immunology. You know? Um, But yeah, I would I would really love to do a little bit more work. Um, One of the things I'm very, very keen to do is try to introduce research in an undergraduate level, because we have something Mm. called the Biomed Research Project, which not many, not that many people do because it's it's quite niche. And you do go into a lab for just over the semester to try and do a bit of a few experiments and write something up. But I'm more interested in getting people to understand what research is at right. undergraduate level. So it, may, it won't be like an entire subject kind of thing, but I would like to somehow introduce that aspect, you know, of like re- uh, learning how to read a paper, for example. And, right. you know, if you are planning to go into research, what are the things to know about? Like what to expect mm. and how you can manage those expectations for yourself and the supervisors? Because like I said, there's a lot of preconceived notions of what students should do in research and I always Mm. feel like that's not quite well communicated Um, students don't know what research actually is like and a lot of the researchers because they've been in the research field for so long they start to forget what it was like as an undergraduate student especially if you're coming from like a different university as well you know you cover very different things Um, so that, that is something I'm really keen to try and you know talk to people about and organize something so that even if you're not interested in research, right? Like you have no interest in it at all. I still think it's important Mm. to realize what goes on, Mm. at least just a bit of a day-to-day or even just like how to interpret a paper, right? I think, yeah, interpreting papers has got to be one of the most useful skills because you don't, yeah, I don't think you even have to be in research to be able to use that because that is, yeah, that's ultimately about science communication and digestion of of science information as well, so. yeah. Yeah, I think that could very easily, I think that could become its own subject, like a semester long subject. So we do have a subject that's sort of science communication. Uh, it's literally called like a yeah, science communication. So it's sort of introducing scientific knowledge to people in a layman's term um, so that mm-hmm. you can get people more involved in understanding science because science can be you know, very jargon heavy and difficult right. to interpret. So we do have a subject where they teach students how to uh, communicate that efficient, effectively to the general population. Uh, mm-hmm. But yeah, I still, I think, I don't know if there is a scope for a subject or at least it won't be a big popular thing, you know, because it is, it will be quite niche. So no one's going to 
we can't really force everyone to learn about research if they don't have an interest in it. You know, so it's sort of right. maybe like a seminar kind of thing or like a small component within a separate mm-hmm. subject. Um, but yeah, I mean, that's, that's just long-term plans that I would really like to somehow see, but I have, I don't really have any concrete ideas on how to put that into place yet. <laughs> right. Yeah. I'm sure it'll happen though. I'm sure. Cause I think that even, even just having a subject at the, at the end of a biomed degree, or even if it was a, if it was a subject that would be available across the biomed and the science degree as well for anyone interested in research and it, it wouldn't even have to be like biology focused or human biology focused. It could, it could literally be about skills development to bridge those skills. And that could potentially, you were talking about the fact that an honors project realistically is about six months in the lab because the first six months you're in a classroom learning the research skills. Um, it, to me, it would make a lot of sense if I have the audacity to just go ahead and say it, that that could be moved to the undergrad and they, they could quota it. Like I remember when I was in undergrad and doing the doing third year anatomy, you had to have a particular wham at that point to be able to get in. And so I think the same thing, it could be a somewhat limited intake, but that could very easily be a subject where people who are on the path to research, either doing an honors year or moving into a PhD down the track, that they do this, it takes the pressure off that honors year so that then projects can be a bit more extensive or it can be a bit more lab time. Um, And that would be an ideal situation. And for anybody who then doesn't pursue research, those are valuable skills. I think, yeah, and it's a very valid point, but, you know, sort of having had discussions about that kind of stuff, a lot of the time people do end up doing honors just to boost their WAM to end up in med, right? So they're not exactly fully into, I'm sure there are a lot of med students who are actually interested in research and would like to do some form of it at some point. But the unfortunate sort of real, real view of it is that people do just end up doing honors so that they can find a way to boost their whams and they just want to get into right. medicine. Uh, so it's kind of, diff- and I think that's one of the things that's been really difficult to sort of justify having a whole subject um, is because we don't know how many people would actually want to take it up. And, you know, there's a lot of work that goes into developing a subject as well. Mm-hmm. Um, but you know, it, it's a possibility and it's something that I've had, I actually had a very recent discussion about how it could be implemented with some of the other mm-hmm. teaching staff. Um, in my department and yeah we'll we'll see how it goes <laughs> yeah yeah it's, it's a bit of a shame that it's interesting you bring that up because that's something that i've always had a pretty strong opinion about because i'm i'm pretty i'm pretty honest about the fact that research as a career has never excited me personally um and i think it does come down to what you want out of science or what you want out of your job and what you do do with your life um and it's always been a bit disappointing to see people using an honors year as a, as like an extra year, like just to buy time almost so that they can then move on into an MD. Because to, to me, it's like honors projects, uh, I see them as, as they're, they're as valuable as any other place that is limited because they have a really important social role as well. And so you really want people who are one going to make use of it. Obviously people can make career changes and that kind of thing as well. I mean, we're talking about the fact that you, you're, you've moved into to teaching, but obviously you're using those skills, right? Like um, it's people should have career flexibility, but um, yeah, I, I would hate to see that trend continue where one, people see research as a backup, which really I don't agree with um, because it, it, this is what I hope to do with this podcast as well is actually one show the very important relationship between research and clinical practice, but then also probably put more emphasis on the research side of things, because ultimately this is where it all starts as well. And yeah, like I I might be rambling a bit, but uh, some some people have said to me, like when I didn't get in last year, like, I'll just do a, like go back and do like a research pathway or like this or that. I'm like, no, I'm not going to, because I'm not going to pursue it. That's crazy. And it's, it's just wasting a spot that someone who is very talented could really make a career out of that and actually contribute properly to it as well. So um, you're right. I think that, yeah, putting that subject in it, it could potentially attract people who are using the honors year as a backup or something. And it's also, it's also it's, like, 
um, it's a lot of investment for labs to train up a student. Um, you know, yeah. it, it's, it's a lot of time and energy and resources. Um, and it's always very disappointing when you train up a really good student. And I've seen this happen in many labs. You know, you you train up a really, really good student and you they're they're amazing. They are really switched on. They know what they're doing. But, you know, at the end of the day, they go off and do med, which, you know, obviously, like you said, they're allowed to like they if that's what yep. their passion is and they just want a year of research. Um, and that's great if, if that's all they wanted to sort of just to be in that field. It was really nice to have them for the year, but it's always disappointing for researchers who do the training and be like, could have invested. Could have, yeah, there could have been so much more that they developed from that, which again, in no fault of the students, no fault of the researcher, like everyone's allowed their own options and opinions. But it's just one mm. of the things that just come up in research in terms of like right. spending that amount of resource in teaching all these mm. lab skills and, you know, um, research methods. Um, mm. But yeah, that that's that's how the cookie crumbles sometimes. Yeah, but I think I think you're right as well that that education and that understanding of what research is happening a little bit earlier is probably something that can help with that. And that again, like it's it's what I would hope to do with this this particular episode and this podcast in general is that people actually have a real like a realistic view of what. The path is so if they're entertaining it they know if it suits them or if it doesn't as well so they can make a more concrete decision about what it is they want to do and it's the exact same thing like i think that the the vast majority of people watching this probably have in their head that they want to practice medicine but i think i would hope that there are going to be people that watch these episodes and actually listen to someone speaking like you have done today, speaking about your career and what you've done with it, what you're passionate about, what excites you about it as well. And then they realize like, wait, that's what interests me the most. I would actually hope that happens, not to take people away from medicine or suggest that people aren't suited to that or one or the other, but just that I'm kind of learning myself that you always think you know what you want. And then as soon as you learn about something else, you realize, oh, I have interests there. Yeah. That, that the whole like, I'm only almost 30 years old, but like my whole adult life, I've just been learning that what I thought I was really passionate about, I probably was, but it wasn't the be all and end all. Yeah. And I realized that just like learning about other stuff is actually where the value is. And you can find that you can have a second interest or you can have something that is more interesting. And I think pursuing that is, is what you should do rather than like sticking to a hard and fast plan. So I would hope that this helps people kind of contemplate that look my my bottom line you know in terms of this message about research and choosing research and honors and all of all of this the bottom line for me is that don't ever consider research as a next step or backup option mm -hmm. as you said before like yeah. it's not you have to actually be committed to it so uh you know some people say it's a backup but there are also people that i know who has just gone on to do honors and then they've done well enough in honors and gone on to do a PhD because it's like, oh, it's the next step. Um, right. You really have to consider if you want to do a PhD or not. And I think for me, it started off being like a next step thing. It's like, oh, I did well in honors. I enjoyed it enough. Um, I guess I'll just do a PhD because mm. it, meant, it meant that I could spend more time in Melbourne and do all of that as well. Um, mm. Obviously at the end goal, like I did want a PhD at the end because I wanted to do a lecture. So but mm. it was a part of me where it was like, it just makes sense to do a PhD because it's the next step. Um, and if you don't have any other reason apart from the fact that it's the next step, halfway through your PhD, you are going to hate life so much because one, you'll be miserable doing things that you're not super passionate about. And you will be seeing all your other friends working, earning a lot more money than what you're getting for your PhD stipend. Right. And that is very depressing as well. <laughs> yeah yeah that's some really really important advice oh, yeah like never take things as a next step like you actually have to plan and have a reason for doing it yeah absolutely cool and so we we've i've detoured us back onto research a little bit but i'm going to jump back around to to teaching and things as well so yeah. with with the teaching role that you have now and, and looking to to the future as well um what would you say are some of the most rewarding aspects of now being in teaching? Obviously, it's still a relatively new position for you, but I'm sure you've probably reflected on 
some of the differences to research. And this is this is not to say that research is a terrible career or anything. Yeah, of like, course, of course. Is, it's, it's people make decisions <laughs> and people should follow their interests at any one time. Um, but yeah, what, what would you say are probably some of the more like rewarding or valuable aspects of, of teaching others? Yeah, I think it's definitely those aha moments. Um, you know, when, when you, because one of the things, so we, I have to learn a little bit about pedagogy as well. So that's like the science of teaching. Mm-hmm. Um, so one of the critical things that, you know, you need to try and get across, especially to undergrad students is those critical concepts where like it's the foundation of all their knowledge. And once they understand that concept, everything just sort of clicks and makes sense. And you go like, aha, yeah, you know, the, the light bulb moment. And I've had a few of that happen in uh, the couple of lectures that I've given so far. So, you know, it's, it's good to see that students take that on board and reflect and be like, understand why that's the case. Um, yep. And I think it's also really nice to see how I can hopefully make up for things that I wish I knew when I was in, when I was going through studying. So I try Mm. to be a little bit more interactive, you know, try and get people to answer questions and they have to tell me an answer instead of me just giving them an Mm. answer. And, And I see that they work through it a little bit more. And obviously, you know, and this is more uh, applicable when I'm doing like small group teaching. So if I'm like demonstrating or running a tute, um, mm-hmm. you sort of get them to ask, you ask them questions and 89% of the time, everyone's really quiet or don't really answer. And you wait long enough and one person like very softly speaks up the answer. But, you know, after going through that a few times, you see people get a lot more confident and they are willing to take that risk and make that statement of what they know or what they don't know. And I think that's that's a really great moment when you see people are willing to push past that. Um, and that's something that I've been trying to, you know, push to tell people, like, it's okay to get things wrong. It's okay if you don't know the answer, like you're here to learn. Um, if yeah. I'm asking you a question and it's wrong, like, I'm not going to berate you for it. Like, I just want you to tell me why you think that's the answer and then I can correct you. So yeah. it's really nice to see people actually take on that approach. Um, and like, this is a bit of a side note. Like I finished giving four lectures recently and someone sent a post on Unimail Love Letters on uh, Facebook. And it was- Oh, like, you're on there now. Yeah, Kate, uh, your immunology lectures are really great. And I am 98% convinced a friend sent that as a joke. But then <laughs> in, the, in the comments, there were actually some students who I recognize from like class list and stuff that yep. who actually like commented was like, you know, they would tag their friends and be like, yeah, this is so true. Or like, you know, facts. And that felt really nice. You know, it's like, oh, people actually yep. enjoy the lectures that I'm giving and they found it helpful. And right. I'm sure there are people who absolutely hate the way I lecture because there's no way you can cater for everyone. But it's yep. nice to see that there are actually people who do find it useful. And yep. that's what makes it a lot nicer for me compared to research because research, people might find it useful 10, 20 years down the track and you don't necessarily get attributed to it unless it's like a big discovery, right? So you right. feel you don't feel like you're actually putting anything out there that might directly affect someone. Whereas with teaching now, you're, you're actively being responsible for someone's immediate sort of um, reaction or behavior. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and I guess you're getting that immediate feedback. I never thought about that with research. This feels like we're just ripping into research now. <laughs> <laughs> um, but like... I never thought about that fact that you can do research. You can even get positive results. You can get results that confirm your thinking. Um, you can know that it's the next step in the, in the circle, but then you're not going to get that feedback from others that are using it. The closest you could get is if you were to like search the paper or something and see which reference list it's so appeared in. If like, you're like a big time researcher or, you know, if your, your work has been really crucial and it's been cited like a billion times that people know you obviously just from like, because your paper has made such a big impact and people right. within the circle will know you. And, you know, if it's a really important discovery that somehow, you know, gets, you know, in the media and then it's, it creates a big, big deal, then obviously you get a bit of recognition mm-hmm. there. Um, ultimately, yeah. I think a lot of researchers don't do it for the recognition. They do it because they're really mm-hmm. interested in the subject. And for them, if they can contribute to that field, and end up being cited to further on other research. That's what they mm. like. Um, but for me, like I felt like the research I was doing wasn't impactful enough to produce that kind of effect. And I feel like I could do more to um, 
produce some sort of, you know, leave some sort of mark behind. Uh, right. And because I've always been interested in working with other people and that the whole teaching aspect, I figured maybe that's one way that I can um, sort of leave a more lasting impact. Yeah, absolutely. And I think the way that I look at education is that one of the, for me, one of the most valuable parts of it, although I obviously contribute in a different way as a, as a private tutor to mostly high school students is that you can multiply your impact. Like I realized that the thing that I actually cared about the most is impacting people. And that's partly what drove me to medicine now is like, it feels like it's the next step in the process for me. Like I, I've helped high school students for a long time and I want to keep doing that. Mm. And like, uh, I, I would love to be, to be uh, an educator in, in a university someday. Like, I think that would actually be great. And I realized, yeah, it's, it's impact on other people. But the great thing about working in educating others is everybody in that classroom, you're having an immediate impact. It's branching out immediately. And it's very measurable. It's, it's very quantifiable. Um, you can see it. And it's, it's great. And I think that knowing that it's something that will have an impact for a very long time, even if it's, it's a small part of their educational career and their career in general, like for you, that must be great to know that everyone in that classroom, especially those that are that are writing on the love letters and coming, <laughs> everything, you know, like okay, you you've inspired that person to pursue whatever it is that they're interested in, whether it is immunology or it's something else. It's like you know that you've been part of that process. Yeah, I think. it's it's not even the fact that you have to go on and inspire people, and you know, mm. even in research or whatever field it is, I feel like the main thing is that. I, you know, and just with living and with life, like it's nice to just have some sort of an effect or some sort of a positive effect on someone that maybe mm. it's like a fleeting, like five minutes in that lecture, like, or in whatever, you know, tutorial session, yeah. they felt like, oh, wow, I really understood what he was saying, or I really understood and really enjoyed that content, whatever it is, even if it's just like for that short moment, yeah. it's, it's nice to know that, okay, people have felt like their time was made or their experience was made slightly better by something that I did. And, right. you know, you don't really, that doesn't really translate with research because you don't necessarily make someone feel better with research in, the, in that, right. you know, in any so small moment, it's a very um, big picture thing, which, yeah. you know, definitely still important. And I, I don't believe it at yeah. all, but it's just not the kind of impact that makes me feel like I'm doing anything. Right, yeah. Yeah. And I think that's it as well is like, it comes down to, I think it just comes, to, it comes down to how you operate and that, that can change as well. You know, like obviously when you were doing your PhD and doing the postdoc research, you're obviously very passionate about it and, and everything. And then it, things, things change over time and having, I think what you're talking about there is it just kind of comes down to the, I guess like the, the cycle almost like in the, education can be so immediate it's a short cycle and it repeats and you can keep at the end of every day you can know i've done a good job today i've had an impact today whereas i guess it's and again it's not a downside to research it's just a difference in research is that you could work on a project for months or years yeah. before you've got that i've done my job yeah. and the feedback is very different that's all it is yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. and i think you know it's, it's that sort of stuff that people need to think about when they go into research because i mean it doesn't seem like it's an important thing, but I know for a lot of people it can be because it's the way that you sort of feel better about yourself. It's, it's down to your own core values. And sometimes mm. you might feel like your time is spent better elsewhere and they don't realize that in research or they think that research will be very exciting and fruitful every day. Um, right. Like we sort of skip past this. And again, we're going back to research, diverting from teaching, but it's because it's one mm. of the points that you were sort of talk, uh, talking points that you were giving were, um, you know, talking about, uh, what's a day-to-day -day like in research? And mm. I think people don't realize that research is a lot of the same stuff, going over iterations of experiments, figuring out why it didn't work, spending mm -hmm. a lot of time on a computer and Excel spreadsheets, working through data, um, spending ages in front of a machine collecting data. Um, mm. So it's, it's not as exciting as what some people might think. Like even speaking to my parents, you know, they'd be like, oh, you haven't done any big impactful research yet. I'm like, it's not that easy. <laughs> like, it's, Do you think it's, that people, people romanticize research a yeah, little bit? Yeah, yeah. They think that, you know, something exciting will happen all the time or you'll be the person, the next, you'll be the person who will 
be the next who creates the next step in curing HIV or whatever it is like it's great to dream that big but the reality of it is that you are probably going to be working on a very small component that might eventually lead to someone else finding yeah. this big picture you might be that someone else you might not be um, but yeah you're right in that I feel like research is very romanticized and very exaggerated and no one really mm -hmm. knows what the day-to-day -day really is like um, right it's nice in that research work is usually quite flexible because you are in charge of your own schedule. Most mm. supervisors are happy for you to work whenever. I always mm. say that, you know, working in research is like you, every day is a weekend. So every day is a weekend for you. You can choose not to work. It's fine. But you are technically supposed to work on weekends. So it's kind of like a, I could take it off, but I also know I should be doing work. And there's always yep. more things to do. Like you can plan more experiments. There's always data that can, that can be analyzed. There's always papers to read. Um, there are meetings to be had. So it, it's a lot of different things that come together that people don't mm. recognize as, oh, this is what research is. Right. Yeah, it sounds like it's something that is perhaps not quite an on-off job. It's quite, yeah, it, it's very different yeah. to like a regular nine to five job. Like research is not nine to five. Some people yeah. try to make it nine to five, but inevitably you'll have some, after hours work that you don't get paid overtime for. Um, yeah, yeah so, you were saying yeah. before being able to start yours at, at but at two o'clock and then it's yeah. going to take 12 hours before it's going to be ready. Yeah. 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 Um, so yeah, it, it's, you know, people need to realize that going into research is not necessarily that big fleshy thing that they have in their head because, you know, and you, you look at movies as well, like they get results from an experiment like within an hour and 98% of the time, you can never get results that quickly. You know? Right. So it's, I think yeah. it's yeah, managing those expectations going in and then you know, mm. realizing that you do have to actually put a lot of background work into making things work. Um, so it, I think it's really important that people start thinking about that. If they are considering a pathway in research, um, it can be very rewarding. And you know, like I said, you get opportunities to go travel for work. Um, yeah. You're working with some really, really smart people, have very engaging conversations, but it is hard work. Yeah, fair enough. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I think that's uh, what we we're talking about before, like just having that uh, a very realistic view of exactly what it is. And I think that's the case with every job, like every career, I think it's very easy to romanticize it. And uh, so I appreciate the kind of candidness there and just being able to say, like, this, this is how it really is. And it's, yeah. it's not all perfect, but there's a lot of there's a lot of benefits to it as well. There's a lot of pros just as there is in any job. I mean, I know that's the that's definitely a fact for medicine as well. Like, I know a lot of doctors yeah. who are like, you think that all we're doing is diagnosing patients, but like half our time is filled with just paperwork, you know? Right. So it's, it's, I think with any job and that's the thing at university, I feel like we're not really exposed enough to the day-to-day -day life of whatever work we want to do uh, hmm. because there's no way to figure that out until you're actually within that job. So if people are able to speak to, you know, whatever job that they're interested in, people who are actually working in that job, and if you can find people who are honest about the day-to-day, -day, I think it's really helpful in figuring out whether that kind of life is worth it for you. Mm -hmm. um, you know, again, these sort of things are all opinions. Maybe you are someone who really enjoys that aspect of things. Yeah. So it's really important to keep an open mind about all this. Like right. Everything I said, someone might completely disagree with, and that's fine. Yeah, and just go, I love that. You know? Yeah, it sounds yeah, yeah, great. Yeah, yeah. yeah exactly. Cool. And so um, I guess one last thing on your uh, kind of teaching career now mm. is, are we going to see Professor Loy in the future? <laughs> is, this I the, would, is this the natural progression here? I would love to, but I think that would be very, very far from uh, far down the line, especially if I'm someone who's just going to be peer teaching. So the way right. it's, it's to do with like promotions and stuff. So professors are people who are recognized internationally for what they do. So in oh, order I to be, know. yeah. So there's, cause there's, you sort of, in terms of teaching, all right, you start with, you start right. off as a job title in the university is most universities, not all at Melbourne yep. uni, this is the way it goes. So you start off as a tutor and then you're a lecturer for the next promotion up and then your title becomes senior lecturer and then associate professor and then professor. So I it's see. sort of, uh, dependent on how impactful your work has been. So mm -hmm. if you're an associate professor, your work has been well known nationally. So within Australia, like your teaching strategies, your classes, whatever has been recognized and 
uh, you know, you've published one or two papers on your teaching styles and the different things yeah. that you do. So it's very difficult as a teaching specialist to get to the stage of professorship because you have to be right. recognized internationally for it. Whereas if you're doing research, um, your research can become recognized internationally. You know, you can be someone who receives- I didn't even know there was a difference. Yeah, 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 yeah. So it's, it's kind of that, again, these are the things that no one really talks about because it's kind of like industry related sort of behind the right. scenes. Um, a little bit of taboo about speaking about all of these things as there always is. Um, but I mean, it's that that's how it works. So it's sometimes really difficult to aim towards that. And unfortunately, you have to think about these promotion criteria as well if you want to progress through your career. So right. sometimes the things you do are more motivated by ticking those checkpoints than actually, you know, something that you really yeah. want to do. Right. Interesting. Yeah. Had no idea about the difference between those. <laughs> I also only so, recently figured that out. <laughs> right, okay. <laughs> Is that because you were looking or? <laughs> yes. <laughs> so the, the, the last bit, um, part four of the, I guess, the interview of the podcast is just to look a little bit at the current state of research and also academics as well. I think most of my questions here are relating to, to research. Uh, and I would hope that this, this allows you, I guess, weigh in as someone who is working in the field, has experienced it, and it's just going a little bit more global. We've gone very granular into the work that you've done um, and the research that you've kind of gone through. So the first one, I, I did want to avoid it in the most part, but we have talked about a little bit is the pandemic and its impact. So obviously the, the pandemic, it normalized online learning. Um, and so we're now seeing the delivery of some classes still remain online. And I wanted to get your thoughts on the relative value of online learning versus face-to-face -face learning at university. And then also whether or not you've like noticed any particular advantages or disadvantages with, with online learning. Um, I'm actually doing a course at the moment. Um, and we're, we, this is one of the components of that teaching course. Um, so obviously, as you said, online learning and regular face-to-face -face has always been present, right? There's, there, there have been a lot of stuff where it's like, when you talk about online learning, you talk about like pre-recorded lectures and things like that. Like even mm -hmm. pre-pandemic, those have been implemented. But obviously because yeah. of the pandemic, you know, it's, it's been, you've seen a huge rise in the implementation of it because of necessity. Um, yeah. I don't think there is going to be a huge, there's a huge difference between online and face-to-face -face at the moment because 80% of people still just don't bother showing up for lectures anyway. They listen to recorded <laughs> They listen to the recordings right. later on. So like, yep. you know, for example, my subject, there's about 200 students enrolled in it, but I only ever get, at the, at the moment, we're doing dual delivery. So we're doing in-person lectures and live streaming um, at the same time. And, yep. you know, I only ever get about 30 to 35, if I'm lucky, usually like 20s, wow. people in the lecture theater, about 20 yep. to 30 people joining online and the other 140 or so are nowhere to be seen. So, right. you know, it's, it's, that's why it's like people complain about, oh, we don't want to do online learning. We want to go on campus, but like they want to go on campus for other know. reasons. They don't actually <laughs> go for the lectures, which to be fair, you know, being in person does add a lot more to the experience because you do feel mm -hmm. more connected to the university. You meet more people. And mm -hmm. I really feel for people who have had to spend majority of their undergraduate degrees in online learning, even like high school right. students, you know, spending the last couple of years in of their schooling in an online system is very difficult to engage. And it's very difficult for us educators to engage them as well, because most of the time people don't want to turn on their cameras, which is, you know, understandable because yeah. who wants to be seen on camera doing things at home? But it's so difficult when you're talking to a black screen. Yeah, but, you know, that, and that's an ongoing issue and difficulty. So, you know, while I... I think ultimately it doesn't matter whether it's online or face face to face delivery because students aren't really mm. necessarily doing things in real time anyway. They they sort of catch mm. up because they might prefer recordings because they can pause and play, whatever. Um, I don't think that ultimately the outcome is really different, but mm. I do think face to face would be better because it allows um, students to then experience other aspects of university, which then might, you know, promote them in being more connected being more engaged being more mm. involved with their studies and their progression because when you're on campus like you know we joined that um mentoring tutoring program and that was a really mm. nice experience and we sort of been on campus 
and you start to know other people and that builds up your own skills. It builds up your uh, confidence. It gives you different opportunities to try different things. But if you're stuck at home all the time, like you don't feel the need to go and try all these different things. So mm. I, I think, you know, not so much from a learning perspective, but from an experience perspective, face-to-face -face is significantly better. Yeah. Um, but yeah, in terms of advantages and disadvantages, it's obviously that the engagement is very different. You know, trying to, some activities, um, you definitely want to engage people to ask questions or to, mm -hmm. you know, do group work and stuff. It's a lot more difficult online to encourage that. And, you know, it's really difficult to moderate in terms of like putting people in breakout rooms. Um, it's right. like you have yeah. to jump between rooms rather than just being within the space. And, you know, you can listen into yep. conversations and jump in. So, you know, face-to-face -face definitely has a lot more um, benefits. But for some students, online has been really good because it removes that social pressure of engaging. You know, you can ask questions without mm. actually asking verbally. Um, you know, it yep. gives them an alternative to get engaged. So I'm, I know it worked really well for some people. Um, but yeah, it, mm. it's not for everyone. And I personally would prefer face-to-face. -face. There's also the the age-old question of like, is lecturing even any use anymore? Because it's like, is it really useful to sit there for an hour and have someone talk to you about things? Right. Um, and then, you know, if in that case, does it really matter if it's delivered online or in person, if you don't really care yeah. about receiving that information? So it's, it's a very layered question and there's a lot of, you know, contention behind it. Mm. Um, so it, it's an ongoing debate within the space as to whether right. we do keep some aspect of online learning or if we just scrap it and try to go back to face-to-face -to -face. it'll mm. be interesting to see how everything changes and evolves over the next few years hmm. yeah it's interesting because i think the unis obviously financially it makes a lot of sense for them to keep some online delivery because you can you can multiply course content like once lectures are recorded you can keep those recordings or yeah. it's I would imagine that, oh, I don't really know whether or not it'd be less or more kind of resource intensive because obviously you've got then more tech resources required, but at the same time, yeah, being able to record lectures from one year and use it the following year definitely changes things. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think for me, like I, I just miss, uh, like obviously I didn't have to, I've never done any online learning, but um, I would think that the the actual experience of sitting in a lecture theater to me was so immersive compared to watching a recording that I was more engaged because I was in that space. Whereas a, when I was at home, it's just so easy to get distracted. Um, and it didn't feel like I had committed as much because to get to uni, I had to take the train. I had to yeah. get in there to get up early and all the rest of it. So it was almost like I'd invested time and effort into being there so i may as well make use of that hour so i probably felt i was more engaged as well um so it's really yeah. uh, really interesting and i'm uh, let me know if i'm digressing but like there, there was one of the assignments i had to do was looking um looking at papers about students expectations right and mm -hmm. you know that that whole idea that you're saying that oh i'm going to campus i'm making the effort to go in and spend this hour listening to this person tell me things while I write notes down and then you you say you're feeling more engaged more productive it's it comes up with the question as how much of it is because you have been conditioned to be like this is what university is you know when you go to university you go into campus you go into a lecture hall with yeah. many other people you get given information you study together like that is what we think of when we think of university so mm. then um when we're actually doing it, we be like, oh, okay, we're actually meeting those expectations. Like, this is what I'm doing. Therefore, I'm doing it correctly. Therefore, this is productive, you know, whereas other people might not really think that way. Um, they might, they might still be expecting like very high school levels of attention. Like, oh, why isn't this teacher like giving me more information or like spending more time to give me more feedback? But mm -hmm. it can't be the case because when you get to university, there's so many more people. Um, so those right. expectations are so important in terms of like how engaged you are and how much you think that you're actually benefiting from being on campus. Right. Mm. Um, and that again, another really widely debated and talked about topic in pedagogy and higher education. Um, so it's, it's very, very interesting. And I didn't think too much about all of these things before I started teaching. So, you know, if, if that sort of thing really interests you as to like how education is, you should definitely think about 
working you know in higher education because there's a lot mm-hmm. that goes on in terms of like student experience and um right what students get out of being at university mm. yeah because i've always reflected on whether or not it's like uh, is it just a cultural thing that we've created this this attachment to physical learning and telling ourselves because yeah, yeah. me as a tutor like i admit that my online tutorials with all of my students over the course we pretty much were online for all of our shoots for those whole two years and some of our students still just went you know what we like online yeah. it's better so i still have some online students and i can honestly admit that the online tutorials obviously it's different because it's one-on-one it's private tutorials um it's not to a whole group but there is so many more benefits that outweigh the loss of the direct face-to-face contact because you've got direct access to the internet like yes you're in a shoot you can have a laptop and an ipad there and that kind of thing but having multiple windows open you can just oh let's just quickly google that let's look at this let's get the textbook up let's you know let's scribble over here there's so much more freedom and flexibility for students to engage and research and learn that to me, it's like in that setting, I don't know about higher education, but at least in that setting that I know very well, um, it's like online is a no brainer kind of thing. And I did not expect it at the start of it. I was just like, oh my God, like yeah, how is education going to cope yeah. with this? Because And you realize that it was a cultural problem because before the pandemic, everyone had this deep seated idea that online learning is less valuable, that it was inferior to face-to-face learning. Yep. that it's some trade-off or something when really it has lots of benefits to it and it may just be something that we need to adjust to. And the pandemic probably sped that up, to be honest, that normalization. For yeah. sure, for sure. So it's and definitely so, a very ask- interesting, yeah, it's just a, it's a very interesting mm-hmm. and I can't really give you like a proper answer to it because, you know, there's there's just so many different aspects to it and it depends on right. if you're looking at it from like an engagement view or like actual content learning or, you know, experiences. Yep. So, yeah. 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 And it even comes down to the perspective as an educator versus as a student and so many different aspects. Yeah. And so the the last thing that I had as well uh, was just asking about uh, funding for research. And you said that this is kind of its own can of worms. So we'll we'll try to keep it. We'll try to keep brief. I don't want to take up too much of your time. We've actually gone a lot further than I expected. So hopefully I haven't (laughs) killed you after. No, no, no. But um, so obviously I had a bit of a look because I think medical research is something that has been discussed as something that is losing out in the budget for probably the last decade, to be honest. It's it's really never hit the budget that it probably needs. Um, and looking at some of the data, and I'll try to have this probably up on screen right now, or I'll link it below, is that there has been a relatively steady decline across all fields of medical research. Some have flatlined, but comparing to about a decade ago, Um, the budgets are generally sitting below where they were. They seem to climb on some of them and then dive back down again. Um, And this was, the dive was before the pandemic. So it's not to do with any, you know, shifting of spending or anything. Uh, So thankfully infectious diseases and seems to have been able to hold on to its funding, but uh, immunology, for example, immunological diseases has seen a decrease in its funding. So this might be a bit of a basic question, but how important are research dollars and the kind of annual federal budget to medical research? And then if you could just break down for people watching as well, because and for me, how research act- actually gets funded as well. Yeah, so um, I think uh, there'll be multiple parts to this because it is it is quite an ongoing you know topic in research mm-hmm. because, uh, well, the first thing is research funding is very, very important because it, dictates whether you have money to run your projects and to hire postdocs to um, do it. If you're a lab head who was somehow unfortunate enough to be unsuccessful in grant applications, you have to shut your lab down because you can't hire anyone and you don't have the money to um, run your lab. Sometimes the university that you're attached to can bail you out for like a year while you generate some data and apply for another grant, but it's not always the case. So it's really important. And that's why it's also really difficult to find job stability in as a postdoc because um your your lab head can't promise you a job every year because they have to look at their funding so they can only ever offer you like yearly contracts maybe when you're established enough they can offer you a continuing contract but 
most of the time you're on a yearly or like two yearly contract. Because um, it's so dependent if, on that. Funding. Exactly. So if they don't have the funding, they just can't keep you. Even if you're really, really good, they're like, I just, I literally don't have the money to keep you unless the university bails them out somehow. Um, so right. that's really important. And in terms of how important it is, not just from like a, you know, hiring job stability perspective, but I can give you a really good example. Um, I was in a lecture the other day because I was helping out with this biomed course subject that I was talking mm -hmm. about earlier. So we're, list we're, we're in the pandemics module. So obviously we covered COVID. We covered HIV as a pandemic and we recently just finished um, malaria as a pandemic. So malaria has been a pandemic for years now. You know, the, they, we first started a vaccine for malaria. Like they found the concepts for a vaccine for malaria back in 1984, I think it was, or 1980s at some point. It's, right. you know, taken them up to like 2015 or something like that for it to get to phase three clinical trials, you know, and even then they're still going and still, you know, doing the nitty bitty and the nitty gritty stuff of it and trying to figure out a way to get this vaccine to be eff um, efficacious. It's also just hard because malaria, the parasite that um, results in malaria is a lot more complicated, right? We won't, won't go into right. details, but just think about, you know, malaria has been an ongoing issue. It's the number one killer of children of many people. I can't remember the stats right now, but you can have a look at the stats, but malaria is mm -hmm. so, so prevalent and such an important like risk factor in mm -hmm. the world, especially because it mainly targets like lower income countries, right? So right. they have less capacity to cope with it. Um, so malaria is not something that the more developed countries worry about because we don't have it. Because right. it's very um, localized in tropical um, areas. So mm -hmm. it's taken them 30 plus years to get to where they are now and they still don't have a proper good vaccine for it yet. And malaria research has still been going and it's ongoing all the time. Um, compare that to COVID. It came out yeah, in 2019. Vaccine, yeah. the start, the, you know, we started researching about COVID in 2019 when we were first like discovered and we saw some inkling of it. 2020. We knew nothing about it at that point too. So like, yeah, we knew nothing about <laughs> we it. Yeah, knew nothing yeah. about it. Yeah. yeah. 2020, all this research on COVID. So much, you know, all these like foundations, all these government funding on COVID. We know, oh, we need to find something. We need to find something. 2021, we have vaccines. That's a space right. of two years, right? 2022, mm -hmm. obviously we're still doing more work and there's still more to learn about it. And obviously it's been very important because it impacted the world in unprecedented times. Um, yeah. So yeah, it's taken like two years for us to get a fully functional, well-effective, um, deliverable vaccine to majority of the people, not all, you know, there's still many people in the world who are not vaccinated either by choice or yeah. by circumstance. Um, mm. But yeah, it's two years compared to malaria where it's like 30 years, right? And it just right. goes to show how much because funding for malaria would probably be not as prevalent because it doesn't affect as many people of um, developed countries. It doesn't have a pressing effect. It didn't halt the world like COVID did. So right. obviously think of how much funding has been poured into COVID over the two years and how fast we've managed to get to where we are. Again, obviously it's because of the complexity of the, para, um, of the pathogen as well that mm -hmm. will come into play and sort of the techniques that we have to study all of this. Um, yeah. But if that amount of funding was consistently, maybe not the same, but like even a good fraction of that money was put into malaria as well. Like researchers would be able to get so much further because there'll be more people who would yep. be able to work on these projects compared to mm -hmm. like COVID. I know a lot of people, a lot of labs shifted to a COVID focus because they could then apply for money to do stuff and get published and- the Grant money was there, yeah. There's, there's a you know a portion of researchers who are like, oh wow, these sellouts going to COVID, you know? <laughs> and it's a lot easier to publish on things that we don't know about. So, you know, because we don't know about COVID, um, mm -hmm. some of the really early papers on COVID was published on just a very simple basic immune response it's just like, oh, right. look, it generates an immune response and it's publishable. And, you know, people who jump onto that and get it out first, um, you know, get really big name and they're leading experts in it, you know. So mm -hmm. there's, there's this idea of jumping ship to wherever the funding is. And that's also the case for immunology funding. Um, before the pandemic, a lot of the funding was tied up in cancer. So right. a lot of people um, pivoted to cancer immunology. So understanding how immune response against cancer is conducted, how we can manip manipulate the immune response and provide uh, immunotherapies 
So a lot of a lot of researchers pivot. So sometimes you have to pivot to those areas. And because of that, it's harder and harder to do basic research or that's like very general because there's no funding for it. It doesn't get funded by the funding bodies. So right. the way funding works is you would apply for grants every year. There are different grants that you can apply for either uh, nationally or internationally. Some of the bigger grants in Australia is through two governing bodies called the ARC and the NHMRC. So right. they have different grant application rounds where you submit a proposal of what your research project is going to be, some preliminary data, um, how you would spend the money, uh, what impact that research is going to have. So you have to prepare this big, big document every single research round, submit it to your university's like um, research sort of center body organizing person. Um, yeah. So then they will look over the grant, make sure everything's fine, and then they send it off to. And then that progresses. Yeah. yeah. So from that step, you have to wait months. Mm -hmm. They will review it, stuff like that, and then they will tell you if you your grant has moved on to the next round of consideration. I think there's usually two considerations. I can't remember exactly because I never really quite looked into it. Um, but yeah, you either continue on or you just get told it's rejected. Right. And then and it just stop. Yeah, it yeah. just stops there. And you know, all this time that you've spent working on a grant is gone. And you have to right. start again and write it again. So, so you know, if you're applying for another grant, you can use an old one to um, as a skeleton, but obviously it wasn't <laughs> successful for a reason. So you need um, so to, you have to like, jig it up or like make it a little fancier. Um, and sometimes right. you've got such good projects that just don't get funded because there are just other projects that are just that little bit more spicy, a little bit more like applicable and a bit more like marketable so that gets the attention of the people who grant yeah them. i was gonna say it's almost like the dollars just follow whatever the hot topic is kind of thing yeah yeah and then you know and that just ends up putting researchers against each other because like well we have to and they've recently redone the structure a little bit and i think mm -hmm. there was one point in time where it was a big issue because they had um well-established researchers because they also look at not just your research data but your track record mm -hmm. so how much you've been publishing what impact your previous work had and whether you have made good use of the funding so yep. there was a period of time where a lot of the mid career earlier to mid-career researchers were mixed in the same pool as like senior researchers so obviously senior researchers have a better track record so they're going to have yep. an advantage and it makes it really right. difficult to apply for grants um, the national average mm -hmm. at least in in my area in immunology um i think the average of average success rate is about 12 or 13 percent and oh wow yeah is that because it's just a large volume of applications or is it because it's a bit of so i don't i think obviously the amount of funding for the volume of applications is just they just can't keep up with it uh yeah. our department generally does a little bit above average so it's a little bit better but it's never more than 20 percent. so it's right. very and that's why one of the reasons why i really wanted to pivot out of academic research because um, it is so competitive. I mean, yeah. you it's great work and some people really enjoy that grant writing process. I couldn't bring myself to sit in front of a computer for nights and nights preparing this document, send it off, get rejected. Knowing as well again. that your job for the, like your contract for the next year or two relies on yeah. the, the yeah. success of that proposal. So usually yeah. as an early career researcher, so someone who's just finished their PhD, you don't quite have to worry about writing grants it's usually about three or four years once you finish that hopefully you've got a bit of background behind you a bit of um you know uh substance behind your research then you can start using that to apply for grants because they're of they have some like grants that are specific just for early career researchers um yeah. so yeah it is it is very competitive and it doesn't make it easy as an academic um researcher if you want a mm. career in that, it is something you have to battle. It's doable. You know, lots of people do it, yep. but mm -hmm. you need to have that tenacity and interest in pursuing this ideal, um, this concept to actually push yourself right. to get to that point. Mm. Interesting. And are there any, is, is there any element of private funding that happens? I'd imagine if there is, it's probably very small. Yeah. So relative. Um, you can have, you know, donations from foundations. Um, mm. You can have obviously working. Uh, sometimes you have labs working in conjunction with industry partners. So you know, some labs have like, like people from I don't know CSL or Pfizer, 
they might contract mm. your lab to do because you have your lab has the techniques for it they might say here's our drug we want you to test the efficacy and stuff so then when yeah when you when you actually publish the result um you do have to say that you know this is funded by whatever company um right but yeah generally it's less uh dubious compared to like if the company itself was running the test because as a research mm. group external to it you're in academia you still have a lot more ethics and integrity that you have to uphold yeah there's a bit more um, objectivity people, yeah yeah um yeah. so there, there is a chance for like private funding that way as well right yeah i didn't actually think about that the it makes sense the pharmaceutical side of things actually funding projects for the advancement of or for the testing of that particular pharmaceutical yeah yeah hmm. interesting Okay, well, um, I think that's everything that I had planned to kind of chat through with you today. So was there anything else that you wanted to add to, to what we've talked about? No, I think I've uh, blabbed enough. <laughs> I feel like I've talked a lot about myself, no, really... uh, but hopefully people will find this useful. And, you know, if there are lots of questions that come up, I'm more than happy to do another session and we can like actually target specific things. Um, sure. But yeah, I think in general, the my, my general message is just, you know, keep an open mind about, what it is that you're doing and try to recognize how things fit together because um, it's really important to think about how we can work together to benefit the greater good for lack of a better term yeah. um, and also just really think about why you're doing things you know, are you doing things just because people are telling you it's the next step because you feel like oh i don't know what else to do so i'll just do this thing um, actually have a reason for doing what you're doing yeah yeah Perfect advice. And then finally, um, is there any, you mentioned that if anybody has any questions, did you want to share your like Twitter or anything like that? I'm not sure if you use Twitter uh, or Instagram. I, I do have a on. Twitter. Um, you could at me. Um, I think I just, it's just Keating. So J-U-S-T-K-E-I-T-I-N-G. Yep. Um, okay, cool. So yeah, you can, you can share the Twitter. That, that's my like academic Twitter as, as, as everyone yeah. has these days. Um, <laughs> But yeah, like otherwise, you know, if there are comments, you can let me know and I'm happy yep. to chat a little bit more. Absolutely. Cool. All right. Easy. Well, thanks again for your time today. Um, I'm sure everyone's found it really helpful. And yeah, if you're open to do another session, I'm sure we'll do another episode in the future. Yeah. Thanks again for having me, Jesse. It's, it's been nice. Yeah, not a problem. Cool. All right. See you later, everyone. See ya. I hope you enjoyed this episode of the Dissecting Medicine podcast. Please leave me a comment with your thoughts and share this episode with others that might benefit. Otherwise, thanks for listening and I'll see you next time.